and welcome to Citizens Climate Radio. In this podcast, we highlight people's stories, we celebrate your successes, and together we share strategies for talking about climate change. I'm your host, Peter Santoscano. Welcome to episode 11 of Citizens Climate Radio, a project of Citizens Climate Education. This episode is airing on Monday, April 24th, 2017. In this episode, we take another trip to the future. In the art house, we hear from a historian in the year 2167. He will reveal who the celebrities of the future will be. For our puzzler question, I sat down with Dave Barbier at the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. Besides polar bears and future generations, Dave points out several other compelling reasons to address climate change. But first, we have our main section. Many young people have been asked the age-old question, what are you going to be when you grow up? Chances are most people are not doing what they said they would do when they were five years old. If so, we would have a glut of firemen, princesses, wizards, and animal doctors. I wonder about the factors that lead us to choose the professions we take on. How does a minor interest become a lifelong career? And how do lifelong passions actually choose us? On today's show, I speak with a college professor with significant accomplishments under his belt. I also speak with a 14-year-old high school student who is just beginning to find her way in the world. They both share a passion to address climate change. In particular, they care about the marginalized people who are affected by global warming. Meet Dr. Hugh Seeley. Originally from Barbados, Dr. Seeley now lives in Grenada. He is a professor in the Department of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at St. George's University in Grenada. As a young adult in the early 1980s, he traveled far from his Caribbean home to a much colder northern climate in order to study chemical engineering. The Canadian winter came as a shock to him. I remember the, the first winter that we had in Montreal when I was there. I went outside and I was, I was so excited that I had my hands up and I was catching the snowflakes. And then four months later, I was, I was fed up with snow. Um, I never wanted to see another snowflake again. The sidewalk were full of the snow after the snow plows push it off the roads and I had to buy bigger and bigger boots to get to school. Hugh Seeley survived that winter and several more in his pursuit of advanced degrees. He also carved out a path for himself and his interest. While working on his chemical engineering degree as an undergraduate, he had a revelation that shaped his career for the next 30 years. I would say that the euphoria moment hit me, well, at McGill in Montreal, when I was doing an air pollution course, and I was told by the professor that we as engineers should just build the stacks, the the chimneys higher and higher, and and dilution was was the solution to the problem. The epiphany hit me that that engineers have a responsibility um, towards the environment, that we're the ones that build the things that either pollute the environment or can clean it up. And and therefore, I resolved at at that point to be an engineer, but to have an environmental slant. Engineers have a responsibility to the environment. Dr. Hugh Seeley took that responsibility seriously. He moved to the UK to continue his studies. There, he earned a master's degree in environmental pollution science and then a PhD in environmental science. And then I was given a a tremendous opportunity by the the government of Barbados um, at a relatively young age to head up the environmental protection division of the the government. That just shaped my career from, from there on in. Dr. Seeley has used his skills and passions as an environmental engineer to aid island nations. He assisted in the National Sustainable Development Policy for Barbados. He has also worked on national energy policies for St. Lucia, Dominica, and Grenada. He has taken on coastal water quality standards and legislation. 
He is currently working on geothermal legislation and regulation for Grenada. Back in episode 9, Eileen Flanagan talked about the roles we can take as change agents. Dr. Seeley serves as an advocate. He works within a system to bring about meaningful and lasting changes. His work has had international impacts. He's been active in the UN Framework on Climate Change. As a member of the Clean Development Mechanism, or CDM, he and his colleagues have overseen funds collected through a carbon market. They then use the income for development projects around the world. The process helps most vulnerable nations and people respond to climate change. I asked Dr. Seeley about carbon pricing and about the work he did with the CDM. My daughter hates it. My daughter calls it trading and pollution. Because there are a whole bunch of people that don't think that markets have any role to play in pollution abatement. I'm on the other side. I believe that markets do have a role to play and that they help countries find the least cost to mitigate. It was the Americans that actually came up with this to, to solve acid rain. It was uh, George Bush Sr. that started this thing of cap and trade on sulfur dioxide. And that has been a proven success. So under the Kyoto Protocol, there was a flexible financial mechanism called the, the Clean Development Mechanism, which, I, yes, I was on the executive board of that for, for about eight years. And I was a chair of that board. And uh, what happened there was that the developed countries took on commitments, legally binding commitments under the Kyoto Protocol to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by around 6 percent below 1990 levels by 2012 under what was called the first commitment period. And the second commitment period actually runs now from 2012 to 2020. And these developed countries are allowed to buy carbon credits from developing countries. And how are these carbon credits created? By, the, by developing countries doing renewable energy projects or energy efficiency projects to uh, reduce the amount of, of greenhouse gases that they are emitting. As a result of the CDM, we've estimated that the CDM has facilitated over $200 billion of investment in developing countries, has saved the, the developed countries billions in dollars of, of mitigation costs. It has worked in the past. And there may be other ways that we can approach the carbon pricing. I know a number of countries are now looking at carbon taxes as, as perhaps a more efficient way to put a price on carbon than the actual trading of, of units. Dr. Seeley finds himself on the front lines of climate change. Low-lying islands in the Caribbean are already experiencing significant changes with many more projected. I asked Dr. Silly what climate change looks like right now in Barbados and other Caribbean islands. Well, we're already seeing coral beaching events this year and last year that destroyed copious quantities of, of, of coral. We are seeing sea level rise at around three millimeters per year, and that rate of sea level rise is accelerating. We're seeing more Category 4 and Category 5 hurricanes. We're seeing a, a complete disruption of our hydrological cycles. In plain terms, the rain is not falling the way it fell in the past. Our farmers are recognizing that. We're losing our fish stocks. The fish are migrating away from the warmer waters. We're seeing a multitude of impacts right now. I, I remember looking at a study that was done back in 2010 by the UNDP that that looked only at sea level rise and how that would impact on the tourism infrastructure that we have here in the Caribbean. And those numbers are horrendous. We will lose a vast majority of our high-end tourism amenity. And to replace that is going to cost up to 50, 60, 70 percent of GDP. It's going, to, it's going to become impractical, quite frankly, to replace that lost infrastructure, airports, seaports. Uh, etc. This is not good news for us on small islands. That it's getting hotter and it's getting drier. In my neck of the woods, and that's the southern Caribbean region, it's becoming fairly obvious to us that our summers are getting hotter, our winters are, or quasi winters that are getting uh, warmer as well, or dry seasons are getting longer. We are experiencing more more frequent drought. The rainfall that we are getting is more intense, uh, but less frequent. And, and that's impacting our, our ability to store that precious fresh water. 
Dr. Seeley outlines severe risks with devastating impacts on island dwellers. What happens when these islands become unfriendly for the inhabitants? It's become an absolutely clear that for some small islands, the low lion atoll type states, like some of the islands in the Bahamas, some of the islands in the Pacific Ocean, they're facing an absolute physical existential threat. That sea level rise coupled with uh, storm surges and extreme weather events, uh, loss of, of their coral, Will, will mean that those islands will, will cease to be viable human settlements and that they will have to migrate away from those islands. Other, other islands, larger ones, those with, with, with more mountainous interiors, yes, the, I can see internal migration occurring, internal displacement occurring, but, but others will just be completely lost. In hearing Dr. Seeley talk about problems and solutions, I am reminded of the creativity I often see in engineers. I think engineers, we solve problems. We're trained to be problem solvers. As far as, as, being, as being creative, I, I draw upon both an, an art, artistic side of me, I, I suppose, or a visionary side of me, and the, and the, and the practical or pragmatic side of me uh, as well. If those, if those two sides can come to a consensus, then I think we have a we have a fairly elegant solution to whatever problem I'm, I'm facing. I'm an eternal optimist. I think I have to be in the job that, that, I am, that I'm in. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm relatively uh, optimistic that, that mankind is going to recognize the urgency of the situation and we're going to put all of our ingenuity to, to bear on this and, and that we're going to solve this problem. The glimmers of hope that I have are the Paris Agreement itself. I think the Paris Agreement in, in 2015 was historic. We now have to implement that. I think divestment away from fossil fuels and, and those, those companies that are recognizing a low carbon future is the way to go. I, I think that provides um, a glimmer of, of, of hope as well. Dr. Hugh Seeley started on a path back in the early 1980s. His interests, passion, and training shaped his career. Another contributing factor has been the world around him with its growing and changing needs. We live in extraordinary times. As young people consider what they want to be and do with their lives, climate change is taking center stage in all of our lives. At the recent Citizens Climate Lobby Northeast Regional Conference, I spoke with a ninth grader about her first steps in forging a path in the world. Meet Adia Samba Ki. A 14-year-old high school student, Adia studies at Springfield Renaissance School in Massachusetts. Adia has big ambitions. She is speaking out about climate change. She's currently working on a comedy routine to help people better understand global warming. I asked Adia about her role on this new and changing planet. So, as you can tell, I am pretty insignificant in this world, <laughs> at least as far, like, in my viewpoint, just, you know, 14-year-old black girl just living on this earth. But one of the, part, the points that I hit in my show, that, like, informing people about this gets them more interested in it, and informing it in a way that makes them feel like they can relate to it. It makes the idea of climate change more tangible and realistic that something they can like reach out and grab instead of something that's far away that you won't bother putting the effort and time into researching. How does it happen? Out of all of the many issues demanding attention, how did Adia Sambaki get tangled in climate change? It actually started very recently, in December 2016, in her environmental science class. Each year, the students organize a debate about climate change. This year, though, something was different. For the first time in like her four years of teaching, she realized that we all came to the consensus that climate change is real. So it's going to be a pretty tepid, like boring debate. <laughs> so after we had the conversation, we ended up having the debate for, you know, an LT grade. And we decided, like, what could we do with this information? We're not just going to sit here or just let it... Like, dissipate and waste away, so we decided to use it and put it into good use. The students held the debate anyway to get practice, then they decided to try other climate-related activities. They used social media to connect with their peers and the public. Some students made a climate documentary. And Adia? 
I'm interested in like, comedy, journalism, and like presenting and performing. So I decided to do like a John Oliver, John Stewart kind of talk show about different topics. And the first episode was global climate change, where I dissected global climate change. I mentioned carbon fee dividend, which is a way to financial look at global climate change and how to end it or at least slow it down. And eventually it all built up to this rally that we had and where we invited members of a local politics, such as a councilman. We invited two state reps and the rest of the high school. At this school-wide event, the students screened their documentary. They also gave presentations to get people engaged in climate change. And then I ended the, uh, the rally with a speech that I wrote, just kind of brought it together of why we should care about climate change. Audia sees connections and interconnections on a local and global scale. Most important thing that I hit in my speech was the idea of how it affects different people, impoverished neighborhoods, people of color who are less likely to receive help from the government or when they're affected by climate change. Uh, issues like the Dakota Access Pipeline, just events like that and how they really shape our nation. And then we also talk about local issues. For example, there are a lot of asthma sufferers that happen to go to Renaissance and they're affected since we live closer to a factory. And so that's why one in six black kids are more likely to uh, get asthma versus one in 10 overall. So just events like that, will just the intersectionality of different issues like social justice and environmental justice come together. And it was just one really cool cool, 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 end result. <laughs> this passion for climate action is a new development in Audia's life. She's learning quickly about some of the very issues that Dr. Hugh Seeley has been working on in the Caribbean for years. She's also very patient and compassionate towards people who are aware of climate change, but not yet engaged in doing anything about it. At one point in my life, I was definitely one of those people. I believe that it existed, but I didn't have the initiative to push forward. And like during the conference today, when they talk about don't talk about the future because it's far away and people don't tend to think about it, but think about when you were younger and what you wanted to happen. But I also think about what's going on right now or people who are already affected by climate change, who are regressing in like developmental changes because of torrential storms and hurricanes. Haiti and then the island of Dominica that was, that was affected by a hurricane and they were sent back over 20 years in developmental gains because of how powerful the storm is. Like we shouldn't have to worry, we shouldn't have the future be like the, our main focus because climate it's happening right now. Global climate change, it's happening right now. Not in the distant future, but now. People like Dr. Hugh Seeley, Audia Sambaki, and you, your listener, are doing your part and trying to figure out what your part is in all of this. We all have roles to play on our new and rapidly changing planet. There is plenty of work for all of us to do. And I'm interested in your story. What roles do you see yourself playing? What factors, people, and experiences influence you in your climate work? Drop me a line. Share your thoughts with me. You can reach me by email, radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. Now it is time for the Art House. We once again go back to the future. We travel 150 years to the year 2167. Climate historian Dr. Timothy Meadows reminds listeners of the amazing accomplishments brought about by the climate generation. From the years 2014 to 2050, that's five zero, millions of climate action figures did their part to take on climate change and create a better world. In this segment of That Day in Climate History, Dr. Meadows reveals the important role three engineers played in adapting to climate change. Oh, and as an added bonus, you will hear what they will advertise 150 years from now. I am Timothy Meadows, 
It is Friday, April 24th, 2167, and time for that day in climate history. The 21st century was the golden age of celebrities. There were hundreds of colourful personalities in the worlds of cinema, television and music. Celebrity chefs, home decorators and fashion designers with their colourful lives delighted and distracted the public from the growing fears and realities of a changing planet. The most unlikely celebrities to emerge in the late 21st century were three engineers known as the Three Beans. The media dubbed them the Three Beans because of their unorthodox and inventive use of beanbag technology. Pierre Temblay was a civil engineer from Canada. Marcela Aguilar contributed as a structural engineer from Mexico. And Sunday Mwanamwambwa was an environmental engineer from Zambia. These three were responsible for some of the most ambitious and creative building projects of their time. For example, their elegant and functional flood walls built in 2028 in Lower Manhattan protected the city from rising tides and storm. With these walls, the Three Beans also built community. They included whimsical benches designed into the levees. These created spaces where friends or strangers chatted. Large, low, round structures not only stored emergency supplies, but also served as tables where families gathered for reunions, business professionals met, and activists organized. The Three Beans also designed thousands of projects throughout Southern Europe, Northern Africa, and the Pacific Islands. They used inexpensive materials to build shelters for disaster relief and permanent structures to withstand extreme weather. The Three Beans also provided endless entertainment with their flamboyant fashion choices. They often wore matching outfits. Their lively interactions in public and the festive atmosphere they generated wherever they went kept them regularly in the news for nearly 30 years. During the Parisian flash floods of 2045, they stood in front of the Louvre. There, Pierre Tremblay famously cut off his and his fellow engineer's trousers exactly two centimeters below the knee. They then dashed into the famed art museum. They brought with them their patented, inflatable, waterproof containers, thus saving priceless pieces of art. What were once called pirate pants became the fashion craze, forever known as Le Coupe de Pierre. Wherever they went, the Three Beans injected play and beauty into their innovative and highly effective adaptation designs. On this day in 2167, we remember that day in climate history. Climate History is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on disaster insurance. Ask about our apocalypse plan. We are always looking for talent for the art house. I speak with writers, musicians, visual artists, comedians, and others who use art to address climate change. If you have an idea for the art house, feel free to contact me, radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. Before we end our program, we will look at last month's puzzler and hear some excellent answers. The puzzler last month asked listeners to come up with reasons to address climate change. I pushed you to think beyond the standard answers. So, besides the welfare of animal species and future generations, why are you passionate about climate change? I received answers from lots of people, including this one from Dr. Stephen Hansen. He told me about an event in February at the Carter Center in Atlanta. The focus of this international gathering was on climate change and health. Dozens and dozens of health risks uh, that people are largely unaware of in terms of severity and geographic locations and new diseases like Zika and and lots of other things as far as chronic disease, asthma, and 
cardiovascular disease that's exacerbated by climate change perils. Certainly important to in- include personal health and uh, population health. I also sat down with Dave Barbier. He is the sustainability coordinator for the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. He shared many practical and logical reasons to address climate change, including this one. When I'm talking to people who are coming at it from a more conservative, maybe perspective, like one of the things I like to talk about is national security. And so we talk about looking at, you know, one of the weakest points of our infrastructure is the fact that, like, we live on a traditional electrical grid system powered by these huge power stations. And so those are very understandable, likely targets for attacks on our country. And so the development of renewable energy and microgrids across our nation help to vastly improve our security because we don't necessarily have to be as reliant on one sole source of a utility electrical grid to get our power. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Stephen. And thanks to everyone else who answered last month's puzzler. So, are you ready for the new puzzler? This one actually is going to be fairly easy and it's also very important. I would love to get lots of answers and I believe I can share several in the next show. All right, so here's the puzzler. Say you are talking to someone named Barbara. You have helped her to see that climate change is serious. It's a serious issue that needs her attention. Barbara then asks you an important question. What should I do next? This is the question climate communicators long to hear. So, what do you say when someone wants to know more about climate change? What are the resources you recommend that help people to better understand the issues and show us how to respond? Tell me about books, websites, video series, podcasts, and more. Send me your answers in writing or through a voice message on our call line. Make sure to leave your name, contact information, and where you're from. You can email your answers to radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. You can also text me or leave a voice memo of three minutes or less at the following number. 570-483-8194. Plus one, if calling from outside the USA. That number again is 570-483-8194. Four. Get back to me by May 15th, 2017. Thank you for listening to this 11th episode of Citizens Climate Radio. This show is written and produced by me, Peterson Toscano. Technical support from Ricky Bradley. Social media assistance from Ashley Hunt Monterano, Flannery Keck, and Steve Volk. Moral support from Madeline Perra. Special thanks to Dr. Hugh Seeley, Audia Sambaki, Cassie Hall, and the Springfield Renaissance School. All of the music we use on the show is licensed, unless otherwise specified. Special music for the Art House segment includes one suite from the free 1920s collection on archive.org. Thank you for listening to today's show. I would love your help in finding new listeners. Share Citizens Climate Radio with your friends. Just look for Citizens Climate Lobby on iTunes, Podbean, and Stitcher Radio. You can also listen at northernspiritradio.org. Join the discussion that we're having over on Facebook with our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Citizens Climate Radio. And you can follow us on Twitter at Citizens C Radio. That's Citizens, the letter C, radio at Citizens C Radio. Visit citizensclimatelobby.org slash blog to see info about our puzzler and find links to our guests. An easy way to share the show is to get a link to it over at ccl.podbean.com. On the right, you will see Citizens Climate Radio listed under categories. That's ccl.podbean.com. Bean. Like bean bag. Citizens Climate Radio is a project of Citizens Climate Education. I look forward to hearing from you soon.